Welcome, Professor. Thanks for joining us on this discussion on GeoBiz. I would like to first understand what is the background of this project. How has uh, UNGGIM come and uh, and under, I mean uh, uh, trying to what is the need for such a project in the first place? Uh, Mrs. Banu, as you have mentioned, topographic mapping essentially is the backbone of all other mapping activities, the thematic ones that come in there. So, uh, and it's a question of scale. And uh, the, the larger the scale, the more difficult it becomes to, uh, to get uh, all the corners of the, uh, the globe mapped. Uh, for example, uh, this was a concern of the UN Secretariat during the years 1968 till 1986. And uh, the UN Secretariat re uh, released a number of projects. In, when uh, the secretary decided right now uh, uh, to have a new structure, namely UNGGIM, to modernize it, immediately we simply said this needs to be revived. We need to know what is the status of mapping. And ISPRS has offered uh, to cooperate with UNGGIM. So uh, the first thing that the UN usually does, it contacts the member countries and uh, we had a questionnaire with some 27 questions and we got all together from the 193 countries, 115 replies. The UN considers that this is a very good success, even though not all the 193 UN member countries are represented. So, so within, within the study, we had to find means how to get the lacking uh, information. So all the 115 countries uh, have participated and answered all your questions. How many questions were there? Uh, altogether 27 questions. And of course, uh, uh, the major question was to find out what is really mapped. Uh, here on this slide, you can see the participating countries. Uh, as you can see, some of them in Africa in particular and also uh, in, the, uh, in parts of Asia, uh, they did not reply because of several reasons. You know, you're coming from India, Survey of India is a basically military organization and there are some restrictions. Okay, uh, th I think uh, so countries have their priorities placed in and uh, moving on to what kind of results uh, uh, that are uh, out of this uh, study, I would like you to first talk about what is the status of the 1 is to 25,000 scale mapping across the world? Uh, the 25,000 mapping is a very important issue uh, because somebody has said recently at the conference, uh, uh, what's the problem? We need 25,000 maps to, to do all our uh, settlements, put them on the map. A map is really a model of the Earth. If we don't have uh, the Earth properly modeled, then right now we cannot uh, uh, make the economic impact and the impact for the public that it needs. And uh, so the uh, 1 to 25,000 is about what, what one has decided what we would like to have. Now, uh, in the uh, 1 to 25,000 mapping, uh, the good news is that uh, in 1986, when the Secretariat had the surveys, we only had about 15% uh, of the Earth covered, the 1 to 25,000. With new technology now, today, we are at 33%. So this is a good uh, result of our survey. Uh, you can see when you are looking at these maps for, of the 1 to 25,000 coverage, that Europe, the USA, Russia, Turkey, Japan, they're very well covered. And there are some uh, lacking information, for example, in parts of China. The reason is uh, the eastern section of China is very well mapped. But on the other hand, there are huge territories like uh, Tibet, the Xinjiang province, which is partially desert, and it needs a big effort to do that. And the same also uh, when you go to Canada and when you go to uh, Latin America. The effort for the 25,000 is really huge. And as you can see, um, in particular in Africa, uh, only 5% of the, uh, the area are properly covered. 
Okay, I understand uh, the enormous tasks uh, mapping uh, the huge continents uh, with 1 is to 25,000 scale, but this uh, definitely there is a significant improvement from eight, 1986 when it was just 15 percent of uh, uh, um, uh, the, the globe was covered with uh, 1 is to 25,000 scale, but now it has moved to 33 percent. That is a uh, good news, I think. And then moving on to the 1 is to 50,000 scale, how is, uh, how is uh, the world faring in this uh, scale? Again, uh, in 1986, it was covered to about 48%. Nowadays, we find it's about 82% that is covered. And there, uh, so we are making big progress in order to get the 1 to 50,000 scale. And um, you can see the only areas that are really uh, lacking are the, the polar regions, uh, for example, Antarctica, which isn't shown here, but Greenland, which is covered to maybe around uh, uh, 10%. And uh, there are some areas like uh, Australia, a lot of it is desert, like Mongolia, and like in Peru. And I think they, uh, over in, in the desert, it doesn't matter really that much. Uh, you can see Algeria in that case. So uh, uh, the big problem with all of these scales is not the coverage itself, but what we found out is also the the age of the maps. We found out we would like to have no map older than about five to ten years, but really it's between 20 and 30 years average. So that's a big gap that we still have to fill outside of coverage. Okay, uh, the map updation is, I think, uh, is something that is taking a lot of time. Time and cost. Time and costs are involved. And yeah. um, moving on to the access, uh, rest, uh, the access to the data, uh, referring to the figure 15 of your study, of your uh, yeah. results of the study, what do you see? How, why is that there are so many restrictions uh, in the, uh, towards the eastern part of the world where there, I see a lot of uh, open data access on the, towards the west? Uh, I think the world has always been di divided <laughs> philosophically divided and uh, when you go into philosophy on, on the one thing it's uh, Adam Smith and on the other hand is Karl Marx and um, Riley uh, uh, Marxism has been more uh, um, restrictive and this is a reason why for example the entire Asian bloc is more or less uh, uh, restricted and uh, the free market economy of uh, particularly of North America right now, it's uh, overwhelming. Uh, in Europe also, right now, uh, there is uh, free exchange of data. There's no restrictions. Okay, uh, that's a good news. Uh, but how are these access mechanisms are being made possible by the national mapping organizations at this point? Uh, the, uh, the, the question is that, uh, okay, in the restricted areas, uh, the maps do exist. And uh, if you go, for example, to Russia and to China, these maps are being used in the uh, national system, but it's not uh, the individual that can look at these maps. So uh, right now, uh, the government is happy that there are a number of competent people looking at the situation, while in the free market economy right now, everybody can have his opinion about this. Uh, so uh, this is the, the situation between restricted and limited access. So is that something very uh, similar and parallel to uh, data being made uh, uh, freely available and free of cost as well? That's a different issue. Uh, when you go to the next slide that you have prepared, right now you can see that um, again, uh, in North America and also in, uh, in some other countries like Brazil, uh, the issue looks like when something has been paid for by taxes, then in that case it should be freely available to anyone without charge. On the other hand, uh, in Europe we are somewhere in between. Uh, we simply think uh, if, if it's worth some money, then you, you should be able to sell it also. Now, uh, there is a big movement right now uh, from the American government, and I think it's also in some of the European governments uh, where it simply said, 
uh, the, our entire uh, globe would be better if we had a, a free market of map data, then everybody could participate. And uh, unfortunately, political developments are not yet that far. Maybe they will get there, particularly also with, with efforts just as geospatial media. Okay, uh, while, I, uh, while I understand uh, this ever-continuing ever, uh, debate of whether the data should be available free or to be made at a cost, uh, because there is a cost incurred to creating the data, but at the same time today there is a situation that with the technology developments that it is very easy to create data and there are so many avenues for data as well. So are, are ma national mapping organizations still justified in their stance of selling the data? Uh, yes, uh, it, it's very interesting that for example, when you, uh, particularly when you go to cadastral data, um, what is a fair price? Uh, to me, uh, the interest, uh, interesting thing was that in Austria, for example, they lowered the price by 90%. And they found out that with 10% of the income, they could get more customers and, uh, than they, they did before because the cost was prohibitive. So it's very important that even if you sell the data, you should really uh, aim at a situation uh, that you get the biggest, uh, 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 biggest uh, um, uh, possibility for circulation of the data. Mm -hmm. That's of, of the best benefit. Okay. Okay, now moving on to my next topic of discussion is about what are the technological advancements or how is this data being uh, revised, updated and created? Are they using how national mapping organizations are still using the survey techniques, the traditional survey techniques, are they or are they moving uh, to use the latest technologies like uh, uh, whether it is in aer aerial photography or s satellite imagery? How do you see uh, the technology advancements being adopted uh, by is, national mapping? There's one technical issue first. Um, there's not shown on, on your slide here, but the question is right now, some countries simply say, uh, will we do complete revision if they do the complete map, or will we do just feature-based re uh, revision? Feature-based simply means uh, we are more interested in the, um, uh, the topic of where the roads are changing and things like that. So some countries have, have simply said, like, complete revision is done in the US, in the United Kingdom, in Saudi Arabia, feature um, you know, bases in Canada, in Australia, and also in Russia. And then the question is, what is the technology that is being used? Okay. And you see the green countries over there. The green countries are the traditional countries of Europe, and they uh, are, of course, they use large-scale data, and they simply th they think in the green areas they can maintain these data best when they do uh, ground surveys. And uh, in the rest of the world, it's a previous slide that you have. In the previous slide, uh, uh, then uh, you will see that um, uh, the, uh, the map uh, uh, data that you have um, uh, right now, the, it's being, um, anyway, uh, um, the revised, uh, by map updating, uh, okay, uh, fine. <laughs> Did I answer your question? No, I would want to understand from you how countries are moving to use multiple technologies and latest technologies in yeah. map updation. Yeah, well, you see, because the density of uh, map content in Europe is so high, so some governments think that they can on, only do that by ground survey. They will use, of course, aerial uh, photographs um, for overview and for checking. Um, the, the aerial photos are a good substitute for the latest information that you have. For example, if even if the map is not updated every 10 years, at least the aerial photo gives you, a, a, or the ortho photo, gives you an update information right now, perhaps every year or every second year. So uh, you are merging technologies. When you go to the larger continents, like in uh, 
uh, North America, like in Russia, for example, you need satellite imagery as well. Otherwise, you cannot cover the entire territory in, in a uh, quick amount of time. Okay, so uh, yeah, there are several, uh, depending upon the topography, uh, countries you see are actually using a variety of technologies. Yes. Bringing, uh, yeah. In fact, uh, doing a combination of technologies. Combination is a standard. Okay, okay, good. Combination is the standard. Okay, so uh, uh, any specific reference to the satellite imagery being used extensively now that we have a very high resolution satellite imagery that can uh, uh, to a lot of, uh, uh, that can be used for a lot of map revision and update? Yes, absolutely. Satellite imagery is, is the technology of the future. I've been thrilled, for example, in New York to hear from uh, digital globe that they have covered the entire uh, continent of Africa at uh, a resolution of 50 centimeters and they're intending for next year to do the same thing uh, for the entire globe. So uh, this is base data if it is geocoded and so forth it, it's some somewhat another map substitute that you can say or at least it's helping toward updating of mapping. Okay, now we have a, a variety of sources of data uh, and one of them definitely is the crowdsourced data or the volunteer geographic information. Are national mapping organizations really seeing this as a useful information that they can input into their mapping activities? Yes, it's very interesting that crowdsourcing is of course discussed everywhere. But on the other hand, a number of governments simply, they don't have the courage to do that. Because what is the issue? Um, the issue that the government is issuing maps or uh, topographic data that everybody can rely on, uh, it's uh, essentially the authoritative data. And uh, it does not necessarily mean that it all has to be done by the government. Uh, the examples in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, all of, uh, of the, the mapping that's done in, in the Arab countries is done by outsourcing. But on the other hand, the government has the, uh, the task and it does it properly right now to find out, um, is it correct? Uh, the quality control is, is the issue of the government. And maybe that's the issue that, that one should do. So crowdsourcing, if you in, uh, incorporate it in, into the thing, which is possible in a free market economy, not all over Europe either, but in some countries, then right now the government must find a means how to verify what the crowd has, has brought in. So it's a collaboration of the government and the crowd. As I see from the results of your uh, uh, survey, um, uh, overwhelming number of countries are still not using the crowdsourcing information as part of their uh, authoritative uh, data creation. Uh, but uh, do you think, uh, is this a reason uh, because they're yet not able to create evolved standards in integrating this kind of data into the authoritative data or, uh, or has there has been a general a disbelief in this data. Uh, correct. I mean, it's a question of organization. If the government uh, finds the capability in order to use crowdsourcing uh, sourcing data in in uh, uh, entering the quality control, if they if they will, or is it is it not good enough right now? Can we do it alone? It's a question of. Uh, a management problem that you have in each country and that uh, that is not a unique answer but it has to be answered in in various uh, various countries in a different way okay uh, another important uh, technological uh, uh, i mean uh, advancement uh, which is uh, quite getting uh, it is catching up very well is the use of uh, 3d uh, how are uh, national mapping organizations, uh, how uh, favorable or how uh, pro are they to, you, to, to move to 3D? Because uh, that seems to be the need of the society. I think that's a very interesting map. Um, as you can see, as far as the 3D uh, uses are concerned, the governments uh, that answered are they using 3D, 
are those that are courageous. They are the green ones. So it, the whole of Europe wants to use 3D and uh, Brazil wants to use it, Russia wants to use it, but uh, hesitant is North America and uh -huh. hesitant is Scandinavia. Why? Because they simply think maybe that's a field of the private sector and not of the government. Uh -huh. So there is a competition in between. Now, uh, on the other hand, uh, the uh, advances that, uh, that have been made, you know, for example, in Germany, they have been like that. Uh, uh, also, at the conference in New York, we had uh, the uh, demonstration of a project that was done by the Ordnance Survey of Britain together with Bahrain. They have had uh, 3D standards, all according to OGC, developed for the entire country of Bahrain. But the question was, and thereafter, is that going to be maintained? And uh, there is no answer for that, because the maintenance of 3D data is very, very complicated. If we cannot do it in 2D, uh, then in that case, 3D will be much more difficult. Uh, the standards are all there. Uh, uh, for example, with the academic community looks very interestingly uh, at uh, city GML. These are standards. I, even in, in Germany, the whole city of Berlin has done a, a huge uh, uh, model of uh, uh, object-oriented modeling for, for the city. You may have seen it when you were at the, in the GEO. But nevertheless, there is no one that accepts the responsibility of updating these data. So this is a problem. Um, maybe the technology has to wait a little uh, while until we have uh, efficient means of updating. Okay, uh, so the national mapping organizations are looking at uh, uh, the private sector to come out and actively participate in creating the 3D models. I think so. Uh, for individual construction sites, uh, like in Singapore, uh, that can very easily be done, uh, the smaller countries. And uh, then maybe you have to just maybe not update, but uh, find some other means, maybe do it new again. And uh, so there are open issues. Uh, yeah. I think there are open issues, but that really triggers uh, me to ask you my next question as to in terms of the private participation in mapping mapping activity. There are several uh, mapping uh, org uh, organizations in the private sector which are actively contributing to mapping data. For example, the Google, the uh, TomToms, the uh, uh, the ESRI and the and also the here and the Bing maps. How are uh, national mapping organizations really responding to the proliferation of data from the private sector? Well, uh, I think uh, again the question is one of hesitance because the private organizations sometimes not as open as you would like them to be. Uh, as far as Google is concerned, they work in projects. Of course, they work with the government together because they buy authoritative data. And this is a basis. And they have a project which they call Ground Truth. It's done in Europe and it's done in, in North America and perhaps Australia. And they're using these uh, and they're trying to beat uh, the, uh, the deficiency of Google, uh, uh, which is the... Uh, uh, in the accuracy, uh, and they get the accuracy from the authoritative maps. But on the other hand, the updating, they can do themselves by street view. That's a very interesting technology. And I think it would be much better if you would have a public-private partnership right now in order to do that. If you can do that for the whole country, at least you should do it in parts. And I think that will be the future. Uh, uh, and uh, that will solve the area of updating because the Google update is absolutely fantastic um, uh, with the, uh, uh, the street view. Um, you know that street view in some countries is not even allowed, but nevertheless Google does it for their own purposes in order to, uh, to update their, their mapping system. What's sometimes lacking is on the part of Google the quality control depending upon what sort of data you get. Aerial photography is, is very often better than satellite data. You must remember that satellite data is often flown uh, in an oblique sense. So 
uh, when you are having oblique images, then simply you may get errors that are in the order of 100 meters. And of course, for authoritative mapping, that is not, uh, this is not acceptable. Uh, and uh, so there should be a, a way out how to do it together. I think private industries should really work together with governments, with okay. reasonable governments. Uh, it, it's not a competition. We can all only benefit by a cooperation. Okay, uh, so uh, I do agree uh, with you that uh, the public and private organizations uh, would be a good bet to work together for the betterment of the society. But at the same time, do you see, do you see uh, that uh, the private organizations are slowly and steadily replacing or, or rather uh, uh, reducing the significance of the national mapping organization? Is that a changing paradigm for the uh, future? Well, uh, the question, there is no really a replacement for authoritative mapping. And, uh, that's a fact. Uh, but authoritative mapping is costly and it is slow. And uh, the private industry does it fast, but not as accurate. And I think what they should do is should strive for more accuracy. And um, the government should, should strive for more speed. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Gottfried Konechny. Uh, uh, this is this definitely is a gigantic task for you, and I'm sure uh, three years uh, you have completed this. Uh, would you like to have add uh, your uh, concluding remarks on this report and how one can access this report? Uh, well, uh, as far as the uh, the report itself is concerned, it will be placed on the knowledge base of the UNGGIM. Uh, and everybody can uh, can look at it right now, including the total beta, uh, database and the interactive maps that are there, perhaps even can be improved. Uh, we have said it in New York at the, at the last one that in order to make it sustainable, it should be a task again of the UNGGM secretariat, perhaps with international cooperation to, to simply streamline the organization we would like to have an update of the mapping system every year and uh, so that it does not depend upon persons or institutions. What so, kind of learnings do you think uh, countries can take from this kind of a report? Well, I think uh, the, the learning, uh, when you just look at the maps right now, it's not only a technical study, but you can see that there are differences of opinion uh, between the different countries and um, it's revealing it all falls into uh, um, into uh, context I enjoyed it very much uh, because it reflects society yes uh, you're absolutely right it reflects the society and creates a good context for the entire geospatial industry to, pl to uh, plan their action moving forward. Thank you so much, Professor Gottfried Konechny, from joining us uh, from Germany. Thank you so much.